So the reading is Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. And in the English Church Bibles, it's page 1183. So page 1183, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Thank you so much, Anna. Do keep that open or switched on if it's on your phone. Um, I'm going to speak about that passage of the Bible for a bit today, and then we're going to do, after our song, that we have after something we do now and again at Christ Church, which is invite reflections or questions or things that you want to know about. Uh, you can ask about those at the end. So if something occurs to you as we go through about, I didn't agree with that or I didn't understand that, make a little note, we can talk about it at the end. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word which speaks to us. And we pray today, please fill us with your spirit so that we can understand and apply and love Jesus as your spirit calls us to do and warms our hearts to do. We pray that will happen today as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's a strange bit of Colossians, that, isn't it? Let me start by telling you a story. Um, once I went to hear a woman speak, a uh, Christian woman, she's an author that I really love, and she was talking about how Christians might begin to think about sharing their faith with people. And I think this story was an example of what not to do. But she's talked about one day she was sitting at a traffic light, and it was a hot day, so everybody had their windows open. And while she was sitting at the traffic light, something flew through her window and hit her in the face. So that's strange. She looked around. The woman in the car beside her was just sitting there. She thought, what was that? So she bent down and picked up. It was something all screwed up in a ball, a piece of paper. She opened it up. It was a Christian leaflet, what we might call a tract. And she thought, oh, gosh, this woman obviously is like, this is her way of trying to share her faith with me. She's thrown this uh, through my car window. So she looked across, and the woman was sitting, clenched, white-knuckled, looking at the traffic light. She had her window open too. And she went to lean across to sort of say, well, thanks for your leaflet, but I'm actually a Christian already. But at that moment, the light changed. And with a screech of tires, smoke rising, the woman sped away into the distance. Now, why am I telling that story? Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, partly because I just like the story. But partly because we've been learning in Colossians that what Jesus has done for us is totally good and complete. Jesus is redeeming everything in all of creation. And if you trust Jesus, if you ask Jesus, you will be included in that. And we've been seeing that's perfect, that work. It's completed. We belong fully to Jesus once we trust in him. And that means, Paul's been saying, we do hard things to bring Jesus to other people because we're safe with Jesus. We belong in God's family 
because of Jesus. Last week, Josh pointed out to us, uh, Paul says, Jesus has sort of cut off, has disempowered the old part of you that used to love things that were wrong. Jesus has like cut that bit off and thrown it away. And even better, he's taken the list that you were aware of, the list of everything that stood against you, the list you would find it easy to make of all the things you've done wrong. Jesus has taken that list and died to take it away. It is nailed to the cross with Jesus, Paul says. So when Satan stands before you saying, look at all these terrible things that you've done, we get to laugh at him and say, well, in history, God has publicly shown that you are wrong and you have no power over me. Ha ha ha. That's what we were talking about last week. It's so good. It's so rich. It's so sweet and comforting and happy. I guess the question and the reason I told that story as the start is, given that's the news that Christians believe, why are sometimes Christians so weird? I mean, why are Christians sometimes sort of so strange with it? I mean, who thought an appropriate response to what I've just said is to go around throwing leaflets through people's windows when they're stopped at a traffic light? And it's not an uncommon story for people to come here and say to me, for example, I think my family used to believe what, you were say, what you're saying here, but now it doesn't mean that much to them anymore. Or maybe even about themselves. I used to be really enthusiastic about what you're saying, but I've sort of grown out of that. Or maybe, as someone said to me recently, the older members of my family, they're really, really serious Christians, but they're also angry and judgmental and hypocritical. They are exactly the type of people who throw leaflets at people they don't know. What is going on there? Jesus has done everything to bring you to God. Trusting him is a way to live the Christian life. It's amazing. It's good. It's rich. It's sweet. What is going on that it doesn't sort of filter through to the way that people are? And Paul in Colossians 2 here is saying, saying to this church, this early church, There are different versions of this that are wrong, that sneak in. And you and me, and together we have to have a responsibility to not let these false versions of the faith sneak in and influence us. Those false versions will, uh, those false versions will be killers of this amazing spiritual life that we get through Jesus. Those people I've described, the person throwing an evangelistic leaflet or the person who says, you silly, enthusiastic youngster, you'll grow out of it. Or the person who says, well, I used to like this, but now I'm tired and bored of it and I'm giving up. What's gone on there is that some wrong idea of Jesus has sneaked in and led them away from the full, true, deep enjoyment of Jesus' finished work for them. And that's what this passage is about today. Three ways wrong versions can sneak in and kill the spiritual life that Jesus brings. Here's the first one. Don't let religious people judge you. The early churches were a mixture of Christians who'd previously been Jewish and those who'd had another religion before they were Christians. Now, the bigger problem in church history has actually been non-Jewish Christians behaving very badly towards Jewish Christians, but that's a whole other story. In this church in Colossae, the Jewish people were the ones causing the problem. They rightly said to the non-Jewish Christians, we are closer to the source than you, like Jesus was Jewish. And that's just true. Jewish Christians have that amazing privilege. But then they wrongly tried to impose following Jewish laws onto non-Jewish Christians. You see them mentioned in verse 16. They had strict laws about what you could eat, about festivals you should keep, about days of rest you must take. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Christians do not have to follow those. Those things were a shadow. That's a great picture. I love the way it works. Uh, No, if the sun is in the sky and you're uh, at, I don't know, Speak Hall, which is a National Trust place near here. So a lot of people in church like to go there. Every time I go, I meet all of you. Uh, You're at Speak Hall, it's beside the airport, and the sun is in the sky, 
and a plane goes over the sun and there's a shadow on the ground, what does everybody do, including the children? They look up to see what's causing the shadow. And Paul says that's what the Jewish law was like. It was a shadow. It showed the shape of Jesus that was to come. But don't, you don't need to stand looking, working out what the shadow is now. That bit is gone. Now we have the real thing, Jesus himself. Well, we have some lo- lovely Christians of Jewish background in our church, and they have never tried to force me to observe a new moon festival, as Paul mentions here in verse 16, although it sounds quite nice. So I'm happy to give it a go if one of you wants to explain it to me. But that is not really a particular issue in our church at the moment, Jewish Christians saying you all need to follow our rules. But let me give you a couple of examples of where I think this false idea might sneak in. Here's, a, here's one. The Old Testament teaches a thing called tithing, which is the Old Testament people had to give 10% of what they had to the temple. But that is not a rule that is repeated in the New Testament. The New Testament actually sets a much higher bar. The New Testament says every Christian needs to work out how to be generous and how to bring equality between them and the Christians that are around them. So it sets a much higher bar for Christians. To be honest, if we could just teach tithing, it would be simpler for me. It would be an easy way to run church members' meetings. If I could just go round and say, 10%? No? Okay, sort that out. You 10%? No? Okay, sort that out. You 10%? Well done. Top of the class. It would make church budgeting very simple. But that was a shadow that pointed to Jesus. And Christians are called to a heart conversation about how to be generous, not to be judging one another based on this surface rule from the Old Testament. But even if it's not about religious festivals, uh, Jewish religious festivals, I think this does surface all the time. Let me give you another example. Did you know you don't actually have to celebrate Christmas? Shocking. Some Christians don't celebrate Christmas. Did you know that? In fact, for a big period of church history in our country, hardly any Christians celebrate Christmas at all. Or uh, let me give another example. Uh, This is one people like Lent. So Lent is the period that some people choose to take of giving something up to get ready for Easter. And I had a friend who in her church, during Lent, people said, you can't mention anything about Jesus coming back to life at all because that spoils Easter. And we're in Lent now. Now, let me tell you about me. I find Advent and Christmas helpful to celebrate, but my friend who's a Christian who belongs to a Presbyterian denomination that doesn't celebrate Christmas, that is fine. That's their business. I don't make any judgment about their faith. I think they're missing out on the turkey, but their choice. (laughs) Lent is not something I find useful at all, weeks and weeks and weeks, where you're not allowed to think about the resurrection. Not my cup of tea. It honestly wouldn't bother me at all if we didn't, and I had to look this up. If we didn't celebrate Jesus' resurrection on the first Sunday after the full moon on or after the spring equinox, which is how Easter is calculated. Jesus is alive every week. But if I didn't celebrate Easter, if I said, you know, to our church, we're going to cancel Easter this year, loads of Christians would look at me and look at us and wonder, oh, are they really Christians? But they shouldn't do that. Now, what Paul is teaching here is our freedom. Feel free to do Lent if it helps you. I'm not being at all critical. Do it if it helps you, but don't judge me for not doing it. You see, what Paul's been saying is, even the things you do that are really wrong, hating people, lustful thoughts, lies, all that has been nailed to Jesus' cross and taken away. So I am not going to let you make me feel like a second-class Christian because I don't follow the Latin computation of Easter. Jesus has done it. You can go the other way, by the way, if you're a Christian like me, you can start to be sort of snooty about Christians who do like to follow liturgical culture. Oh, look at them with all of their vain religion, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't get to judge them for that. They can keep their festivals. Do what helps you to know Jesus has killed your sinful nature. 
Do what helps you to know Jesus nailed your judgment to the cross. In, for different people and in different cultures and in different times, that will happen in different ways. But do you see that if you do add something like this to Jesus as a way of living as a Christian, so you say, okay, trusting Jesus is great, but you'll really be a Christian if you keep this religious tradition or festival, it kills spiritual life. You lose the reality and you get the shadow instead. I mean, you might have met people like this or maybe even be one. I'm standing here talking about this amazing reality that Jesus radically changes your life and disarms Satan and cuts away your sinful nature. This life-altering, paradigm-changing thing that happens when you become a Christian. You talk about that to some people and they say, yeah, yeah, I go to church at Christmas. Now, do you see what's happened? The festival has replaced the reality because it was made a plus that slowly pushed out the reality. And Paul is saying, just don't go down that road. Don't let religious people judge you. I, I actually have had the conversation once where I was trying to talk about some of these things with someone who is from a religious background. I was talking about our old life dying, new life in Christ for the sake of God's eternal glory. I felt like I was really going for it. And they actually said to me at the end of the conversation, yes, but what do you do about Lent? It's like adventures in missing the point. Now, as one of our great philosophers of today has said, players gonna play, 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 play. <laughs> Haters gonna hate, 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 hate. And to add to that, Christians are going to Christian, 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 Christian. That is to say, all Christians that sometimes get confused about this, we like the feeling of judging others, and we go down this road and we end up with a dead religion, or we get snooty about churches that follow a particular calendar. Paul is not actually saying, you people stop doing that. He's just saying, listen, Christians are going to Christian. They do this sometimes. Your responsibility is not to let them judge you. You are qualified by Jesus. All of the treasures come through Jesus. Fullness, new life, free from accusation. Yes, there are going to be judgmental Christians. They do that sometimes. They get it wrong. Pray for the Lord to bring them back and help them find the joy of being, really knowing Jesus again. But don't let that disturb you. You know, Christians are weird like this. Someone was telling me, a friend of mine from years ago, saying their church had split. And their church had split over the issue of whether one person at communion should pray thanking God for the bread and the wine, or two people should pray, one for the bread, one for the wine. And the church had split. Listen, Christians are going to Christian. They do it. What Paul is saying here is don't let that disturb you if you're in Christ. And maybe you come to this church and you're new to it here and we do some religious thing which is unusual to you. Feel free to ask about it. But it's probably something that we just think is best to follow Jesus in our place, in our time. You don't need to leave because it's not particularly your cup of tea. Please don't let us make you feel not your place. Don't let us judge you and get that wrong. You have fullness in Christ. Don't let religious people judge you. Secondly, don't let experiential people disqualify you. Um, Paul says, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels qualify you. Now I'm going to tread the boards of controversy now. I don't like picking fights with other Christian denominations, particularly the biggest one in the world. But in case you think that angel worship is some bizarre thing that never happens today, here is a tweet from the Pope. You should follow on Twitter, it's generally quite good. But he says, let us today entrust ourselves to the holy archangels, Michael, Raphael and Gabriel, so that they may protect us in the fight against the devil's seductions, help us bring the good news and take us by the hand in life's journey so we may cooperate in God's plan of salvation. You'll notice all those things he's saying we should entrust angels to do are actually things in Colossians, Paul says, Jesus has done and is doing. Like, you know... Michael, Raphael and Gabriel, sorry, the position is filled. <laughs> he is doing that. 
But he's, here is the Pope, the leader of the largest Christian denomination in the world, literally telling us to approach us, tell us to approach particular angels to ask for things that Jesus gives us. Listen, I've never prayed to an angel. I think there's good reason not to do that. We can talk about that later if you like. But even though the Pope has tweeted that on Archangel Day, who knew that was a thing? I am not disqualified. I'm not improperly Christian. I'm not worried. Because I'm fullness in Christ. Now the pen portrait of this person that Paul gives us in uh, uh, Colossians is someone who goes into great detail about spiritual visions they have had. Paul's very cutting about them in verse 18. He says they're into false humility. So they love to talk about spiritual experiences they've had. And it's false humility. So they sort of are doing it in the way of like, oh, it'll be very helpful for you to hear about my spiritual experiences. But in fact, what they want is for you to hear about their spiritual experiences. They're like, I really want you to listen to me. It's false humility. And he's saying, if people are endlessly going into detail about their spiritual experiences they've had, they are doing it to boast. They're puffed up by their unspiritual mind, using something that God has given them to help and encourage them to promote themselves, which is unspiritual. But let's just be clear in our church position here. Someone was asking me about it recently. We are not at all opposed to people meeting with God in a deep, experiential way. We do believe, or the leaders of the church believe, that people can still have words and visions and prophecies which should be tested by the church. We believe that is a spiritual gift, which means that may never happen to some Christians, because it's a gift that some Christians have. But many people can be helped by it. The problem is, if that becomes the basis of your assurance, I must be a Christian because I had that experience once. Not, I must be a Christian because of Jesus' work for me. Paul says, well, you have literally then become disconnected from Jesus. Because you are not saying, I trust Jesus anymore. You're saying, I trust this thing that happens for me. I mean, you do have to be able to deal with the fact that people of all religions have intense religious experiences. It is not just Christians that experience that. What marks our Christian spirituality, particularly, is that we continue with faith in Jesus. The faith we had to save us when we first became Christians. As Paul says, he is the head, we are the body. But I do want to be clear, I'm not being cynical or negative about your experience of knowing God, if that's something that matters to you. I want you to know there are loads of people in our church humbly, quietly, living out highly experiential Christianity. But they're just not going into great detail about it from here at the pulpit. And that's because of the effect it can have on other people if we do that. Once I went uh, with some students to a Christian Union meeting. I totally can't remember why I put that picture there. Is it that we're bored by the person going on with their... I don't know why. Anyway, uh, I once went to a Christian Union meeting with some students and the person who was speaking totally ignored the Bible passage they'd been given to talk about and told in great detail about a dream he'd had about God crying when someone was playing their worship music. And it was shared in a genuine attempt to be encouraging, I think. I don't think it was this Colossians 2 person who'd become puffed up and disconnected from Jesus. It was really genuinely wanting to help. But I was sitting beside a student who was part of that group. The meeting ended, and the first thing, the first thing she said to me was, why has that never happened to me? Why have I never had a dream like that? Who knows the answer to that? I don't know. God engages with people in different ways. But do you see, if you go on about your vision to that young, enthusiastic, wanting to grow a Christian, it's a risky business to make someone else feel disqualified. Remember, Christians are going to Christian. You will come across in your life well-meaning Christians who big up their own dreams and visions, and they might even have lost connection with Jesus and his work for them because they love the attention that going on about it brings. There are people like that. If you haven't met any, there will be a feature of your life sooner or later if you hang around in Christian circles. It's just that what happens... Do not let them disqualify you. 
Do not let them think that you are not safely in Christ because they're going on about that. You know the difference when you meet someone who's insecure and someone who's confident. Someone who's insecure is seeking approval, not sure they're doing the right thing, uh, uncertain. Sometimes they're overconfident because they feel like they've got something to prove. Someone who is confident in who they are, well, they are relaxed and able to just say what they think and not worried about other people judging them. Can you see, therefore, that feeling disqualified would kill spiritual life? Because Paul is trying to instill confidence. He's saying you're qualified by Jesus. Your sinful nature has been cut off and killed. Any accusation someone could bring against you has already been nailed to the cross. Can you see that that, believing that, would bring confident, humble, generous, joyful life that we want as Christians, if we really are secure there with Jesus. But I do not think that was the life that student led the next day after that meeting. They were uncertain whether God was really with them because that had never happened to them. They were slow to speak up for Jesus because they were like, oh, am I really a Christian? Not ready to risk much to live for him. And that was tragic. Because this passage says that student has been buried with Jesus in baptism and raised to new life and all the charges against them have been cancelled and they can live in confidence of that. There are always going to be people who get distracted by intense spiritual experiences and undue interest in angels who kid themselves they're humbly helping when in fact they're showing off. Christians going to Christian. Do not let them disqualify you. Do not live less confidently than you can live in Jesus because of something that's happened to someone else. Live thankfully, happily, confidently because of Jesus. Third thing, don't submit to man-made rules. Someone once told me a story about a Bible study they were in. They were looking at the story you may know from the Bible of Jesus turning water into wine. And the discussion ended, everyone was putting their Bibles away, and one lady in the Bible study said, of course, it was non-alcoholic wine. There was a long silence, and she looked around and said, because if Christians are not allowed to drink alcohol, then our Lord certainly would not have done it. Now, that is not a method of Bible interpretation I could recommend. It actually overlooks that in one book of the New Testament, the writer tells the receiver of the letter to drink wine, which in the ancient world, I'm afraid, nice lady, was always alcoholic. Here's what happens when things like that pop up. People think getting drunk is the wrong way to live. That's true. And in fact, uh, the whole movement to get people to give up alcohol began a century or so ago because people getting drunk was causing such a social problem. Getting drunk is the wrong way to live. That's true. Then they think the most important thing is to live in the morally right way. That's sort of half true. Most important thing is to trust Jesus and live for him. Then they think, so what we must do is put a fence around getting drunk to make sure we don't even go close to it. So the best thing to do, make an extra rule to say you don't touch alcohol at all so you don't accidentally slip into being immoral. And then they say, and it's not just me choosing that myself, which would be fine. You need to know how you're likely to be led into sin. But they're not saying I'm just choosing that myself. They're enforcing that on other Christians who might listen to me. Not drinking alcohol is the best way to be holy. That is not true. It appears wise, Paul says. In the world of keen Christians who want to do the right thing, this self-imposed worship, like making yourself do something that looks like you're worshipping God, this false humility, I mean, he's a bit rude about people who do this. I'm not sure, I'm not saying this all about the lady in the Bible study, just in case it was you. Uh, I don't think it was in our church. Anyway, uh, it says false humility. It makes you look like you're giving something up for something important when it's actually a way to prove that you're better than other Christians. And the bad thing about it, he says, it makes the body, treat the body as if it's something bad, which is a really harmful like trace in Christian spirituality over the years to be suspicious of our bodies. 
God loves our bodies and has made us physical beings. But actually, he says, it looks wise, but it lacks any value in restraining sensual indulgence. One time I was in a Bible study like this and the leader said, uh, what do you think sensual indulgence means? And someone in the group said, I don't know, but it reminds me of Georgel. Uh, it's nothing to do with that. It's basically saying, wanting to indulge your senses, wanting to get what you want, putting up rules doesn't actually stop that. It doesn't change you seeking to satisfy yourself. So say you never touch alcohol or you never go to pubs or you read the Bible every single day or you stop having a TV license and you try and impose that rule on people around you, you may stop being drunk and you'll probably get better Bible knowledge and you'll miss a whole lot of like boring television programs. But I would guess your sin just finds a different way to pop out. Someone once said to me, it's like pushing down lumps in a carpet. If you ever had a carpet laid badly, it's so annoying. There's a lump in the carpet, you think, put that lump on, it just pops up somewhere else. That's what these rules do. Remember we talked at the beginning about people who've been Christians their whole life who are angry and judgmental and hypocritical. They are following these man-made rules, but sin just pops up somewhere else as self-righteousness, anger about the state of the world. You know, in secret, they're cruel to their children or they're greedy with their money. The man-made rules they were following lacked any value in actually restraining their sinful nature. Perhaps this is the one that people listening today might be most disturbed by. So you know that being a Christian is supposed to mean living a different life. And maybe you've been doing that by really trying to follow rules taught by others or set by yourself. And Paul's pretty critical of that. He says, it's false humility making my life more difficult so I can feel better about myself. You know, if you're keeping a rule so you can feel like a better Christian, that is not humility, is it? That's the opposite of humility. Keeping a rule so you can feel better is pride. Now, Colossians is going to say there is a path to a radically transformed life that comes through trusting Jesus. We'll see that next week. But actual humility, thinking of others as more important than you, comes from continuing to have faith in Jesus. Following a man-made rule will make you worse. I would guess the leaflet-throwing lady, you know, the one with the car, hit in the face. She's been told a rule that Christians share their faith. And so she's found a way to keep that rule, throw leaflets at people. But of course, that rule did nothing to produce the love for her neighbour, which God actually commands. These things, they have an appearance of wisdom, but they actually cut you off from spiritual life. If you continue to not live in Jesus, trusting in him, you become confident in yourself. And in fact, lots of people who think Christianity is about obeying rules in the end get fed up with it and give it up because it's a totally miserable way to live. Wrong versions of Christianity sneak in. They are killers. And I am willing to bet that where we have Christians behaving badly or giving up their faith or serious Christians who are also angry and hypocritical, I am willing to guess, to bet, that a false version of Christianity has sneaked in. It's true that Jesus gives fullness, that he takes all accusation away. So do not let someone judge you about religious practice. Do not let someone disqualify you because of their experiences. Do not let someone make you submit to a man-made rule. A Christian living day to day out of the assurance of their acceptance by Jesus will, as Paul said in a previous passage, overflow with thankfulness to God. And that is the life that God wants. But submitting to man-made traditions will cut that.
that joyful thankfulness off of the root. So continue to live in Jesus.